Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to the live program number 159 at Orthopedic Principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Iran Maman from Tel Aviv, Israel. Iran was appointed at Tel Aviv Medical Center as head of the shoulder unit in 2010 and works jointly with the Tel Aviv University, following fellowships in Toronto, Mount Sinai Orthopedic and Arthritic Institute. His clinical practice revolves primarily around shoulder surgery. His research interests are clinical as well as basic science in shoulder pathologies and is a head of the laboratory for shoulder research. Dr. Marman is one of the early users of the in-space balloon technique. And Dr. Marman is also the chairman of the Israeli Shoulder Society. So today, it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Iran Marman for this wonderful live program. Over to you, Dr. Marman. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure uh, meeting, having this meeting with you guys. Uh, I must, one, one correction, I'm not the chairman anymore. I was replaced. Uh, every two years, we repair the chairman of the Israeli society. But again, it's it's a great pleasure, and I think you're doing a wonderful job as uh, uh, as, as dealing with the COVID-19, and I'm really thrilled. So we're, we're going to discuss uh, the repairable uh, Kafka solution and approach, and we start with uh, what is the definition of the irreparable tear? So is it the size that makes it irreparable? Is it the patient age or condition, the muscle condition, fatty degeneration, fatty atrophy, the bone condition, whether it's osteoporotic, osteopenic, the duration of the tear? Is it uh, uh, only on chronic tears or maybe uh, irreparable for acute tears? Or the surgeon's skills or technique uh, which probably will be different from uh, uh, each uh, surgeon. So in theory, nearly all calf tear can be repaired, but you know that no, not all should be repaired. Uh, if you ask Barry Savoie, he can uh, repair everything. He can repair any uh, tear. Uh, Gutelier said that only 100% of atrophy should only be the reason not to, repair, to attempt repair. But we, need today, but we know today it's not the real thing. It's maybe Gutelier 3, 4, depends on the study you read. So let's presume we got to the point that we decided this is irreparable for me as a surgeon. So what are my solutions? So we have non-surgical solution and surgical solution, but overall we need to find the right solution for the right patient, for the right surgeon. If we talk about non-surgical approach, of course, physiotherapy, anti-inflammatory drugs, steroid, painkiller, or skillful neglect. If you talk about the surgical solution, so Debridement with or without uh, bicep stenotomy or tenodesis, uh, tuberoplasty. We have partial repairs and option patches, tendon transfer, superior capsular reconstruction. Of course, the reverse and the in space balloon. We're going to go one by one. Let's start with the debridement. So, this study, 31 patients, showed that the ACS score improved from 24 to 69, which is remarkable. Or the other study, study by Boileau, 78% of satisfaction rate, and only pseudoparalysis and or uh, degenerative joint disease were the contraindication. Other study, 39 irreparable calf tears with follow-up of 38 months. Uh, the constant score improved, improved from 34 or 35 to 84, which is remarkable. Remember the number, 34, which is usually the number for uh, irreparable calf tears and to 84, it's, it's nearly normal. So maybe we should debride only. What about partial repair? Burkett start the options or, or introduce the option of a, a partial repair. Badi Savoie saw that partial re uh, repair versus complete repair had no significant uh, uh, difference between the two groups and both groups did well. Porcellini also contest score from 44 to 73, which is pretty good. Uh, and now we have the, the uh, FDA uh, study on partial repair versus the in-space balloon, which we're going to discuss later on. Or we won't be able to discuss much, but we'll try to, to touch this point. So partial repair is an option. Again, depends on the tear, depends on the, the quality of the tendons. What about patches? Patches for augmentation. So you know there's autograft, allograft, xenograft, and synthetic materials. They are deferred from each other. The extracellular matrix scaffold differ from each other on the source of the of the patch, whether it's dermis or small intestine submucosa. 
the species, whether it's coming from human, porcine, or bovine, the donor age, if it's a young or adult, and the processing. So not all patches are the same and probably not all gonna have the same results. Uh, so what are the results? So there is a high complication rate uh, to those surgeries. Um, uh, the graft failure is uh, maybe up to 20 to 60%, which is pretty high. It's quite challenging uh, uh, surgery, doing it otoscopically. And the complete healing is, is Rodeo found out in 2007, it's really cheap. I must say that my experience and other experiences show that it's not truly correct, that it's really cheap, probably from the new patches, the, 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 the complete healing is shown much more often. What about tendon transfer? So Gerber, uh, JBJS 2007, uh, said that the isolated latissimus dorsi is mainly to restore control of the external rotation and selected patient. And for selected patient, they say that it says they have only isolated uh, problem loss of external rotation, preserved forward flexion above 90, and intact or irreparable subscapularis, or sorry, or repairable subscapularis, and uh, ideally that they have hypertrophic teres minor to compensate. Uh, Judith, uh, prospective 25 patient, year, one year follow-up, constant score improved from 44 to 65. Again, remember the numbers. Uh, patient with uh, irreparable cuffter usually start around 34 to 45 constant score and can improve depends on the procedure. Uh, but the results show that there was only slight improvement in the external rotation and radi radiological failure was up to 43%. Uh, so maybe it's not as good as, or as promising as we thought it may be. That's another study uh, of uh, 39 patients with follow-up of 35 months. And they show that the clinical out outcome improved in patients that are younger than 60, unlike the study I presented earlier, and that they have low preoperative eleva elevation, less than 80. Again, not a different, totally different group than the discussed in a previous study. Of course, the intact of subscapularis tendon and the force couple must be maintained. So tendon transfer is demanding and the results are mixed. Uh, what about supercapsular reconstruction? So supercapsular reconstruction is quite interesting. Uh, because the, the, the idea, the, the, the logical behind it makes sense. Uh, there are several common material and it's very important to understand which may give you the best result. The fascia lata, which was the, the first uh, described by Miata, or there's a dermal allograph that you can buy off the shelf. Some way may use uh, the longer of biceps as well. And the aim of this procedure is to prevent superior head migration and restore the shoulder muscle force couples. However, we know that the superior capsule is in continuity only in around uh, one third of the patient as shown uh, in this uh, study by uh, uh, Pullurent. And we lack of mid and long-term clinical and radiological results. So we cannot say for sure whether it's working or not. Let's see what we, we do have on the literature. Of course, we have Miyata that uh, did this uh, surgeries in, uh, in Japan. And he used the fascia lata. Again, it's important. He took the fascia lata, that's an autograph of the patient, and he folded up to uh, around one centimeter uh, width. And, and he put it on, on top of the humeral head and on top of the glenoid. So he had a 34 month of follow-up in this study and the fourth fraction improved from 84 to 148. So it's quite good and a significant improvement in forward flexion as well as in external rotation from 25 to 40. And in 83% of the patient, the, uh, the graft was intact uh, after at the end of the follow-up. However, a big study done in the United States and published in uh, 2018 in atroscopy done by Tokish, Berkard, and uh, uh, Denard and Berde, a very good surgeon. They had 59 patients with thermal allograft and they showed 55% of failure rate uh, with improvement of forward flexion from 130 to 158, uh, around 30 degrees, and ACA score improved from 48 to 78. In all these cases, the biceps were either tenotomized or tenodized. 
So we have mixed result and maybe the tenodesis or the tenotomy of the bicep was the, the effect, we're not sure. So, but it's an option that we should know about it. We have, of course, the reverse. Uh, you are all aware, uh, and the, the concept is transferring the center of rotation medially and caudally, because when we don't have the rotator cuff, the head migrated up and medially. So uh, we want to lower the head and we want to have more uh, lever arm of the deltoid. And the deltoid needs the, the, this uh, amount of distalization in order to work nicely. And you need this uh, amount of lever arm in order to lift up the shoulder. So what's the reverse? That's exactly what the reverse uh, do. Medialize the center and, and distalize the, the, the center of rotation. Uh, and the, the, work, the rest works very nicely. We have now a lot of studies of more than 10 years of follow-up, as you can see here. This is a huge study coming from uh, France with very good survival uh, free revision. There's a nice study uh, come from Mayo Clinic that we uh, uh, published recently uh, with a 10 years follow-up. And it's including their uh, um, learning curve. And yet the results were very good. So reverse is an option. Uh, and you can see it's the results are quite expected. You, most of the patient will be in the, around 110, 120 uh, f um, degrees of forward flexion. Of course, there will be patients that are going to have much better result and patients that will be worse. But the problem with the reverse, it's costly. It's high complication rate, so relatively high complication rate. And when you have a complication with the reverse, that's a big issue. And when what is done cannot be undone. When you choose to do the reverse, there's only that's one way. There's no uh, going back. And recently, or not very recently, since 2010, we have the in-space balloon. Uh, you know, when we thought about the concept of the balloon, and again, I must say, I have a disclosure on the balloon, so you, whatever I say, think about it with a pinch of salt. So there are many people out there that has massive rotator cuff tear and functioning very well. And we want our patient that have a massive rotator cuff tear and he has pain and he cannot function very well to become one that, that can function very well. So, and then we need to find out how to do it, if it's possible without surgery, of course. And if it with a surgery, one that will be with a minimum uh, uh, recovery or with a minimum uh, complication. And sometimes we cannot do it and then we go to the other solution. So we have a lot of science on the reverse. And if you look at PubMed, you'll find many, many articles that come in day to day, mostly in Europe. Uh, later on, there will be uh, publication from coming from elsewhere. And we had many questions at the beginning. Is this put in the balloon? You know, we put it on the subacromial space. We put it underneath the acromion in between the humeral head and the acromion. Uh, we inflate it with saline and it's absorbable. And after four months, it's, it's resolved. And the patient usually say, oh, I felt something in the shoulder and maybe I did deteriorate a bit, but then they will recover. But you don't anchor it. So is it stable? Is it stays in one place? That was one of the questions we had. So if you look at this video, this is from a cadaver lab that we did. We uh, filled the balloon with uh, uh, saline and uh, iodine. As you can see here, the black stuff. Of course, you shouldn't do it on a real patient because now they may uh, cause some damage to the material of the balloon. You see, we tried really hard to dislocate the, the balloon and it stays in place. Of course, if you do a massive uh, release with cutting the coracochromia ligament and cutting the back and the front and everything, it may dissipate. We had a couple of dislocation, but basically it's a quite stable uh, solution. So what in terms of safety and performance? Uh, so there are many studies now. The first one that was done in Slovenia was a prospective study with a five-year follow-up, uh, started from 2008. They were the first one to uh, try the balloon, um, 24 patient, and the safety result was that there were no uh, safety-related adverse events. Uh, 
ultrasound that was done in three months when the balloon is still uh, function uh, showed that the balloon was in place. MRI after three years when the balloon is already gone, uh, there were no bone cyst or anything uh, special uh, uh, from the balloon. And if you look at the constant score, again, I remember I told you to remember the numbers. So 34 points in the constant score was the beginning. That was the baseline of the patient. And at five years, it reaches 66. So these are the number which repeatedly seen on the study of the balloon. If we look at the variables of the contest score, pain, ADL, range of motion were all improved. The power did not, which makes sense. The deltoid is capable of lifting the arm, uh, not much more than it, about two kilos. Of course, again, there are patients that can lift and do whatever they like, but usually the power is improving, but not too much. Another study that we did, that we did in Israel, a multicenter study uh, with 58 patients, 10 of whom were the balloon was put in under local anesthesia, okay, uh, under fluoroscopy. And the rest of the, the patient, the 48, we did it telescopically. And the results were quite similar to the one from Slovenia. We started at baseline in around 36, and the two years follow up, we had 73 point of contrast score. And if you see, the variables are quite the same as we've seen before. Pain, ADL, and range of motion improved nicely, and the power, not so much. So overall today, there are, I must say, more than 700, because there's another study that we're gonna discuss uh, later on, but there's many, many patients that already been studied and follow up from six months to five to 10 years. And so we have a lot of data. And if we try to combine those studies, we can see that the improvement and constant score between the first six months and, the, and then the 12 month is quite significant. In the first six months, uh, it's improved by around 20 points. And if we live by 12 months, it's already 30 points. So it means that people continue to improve uh, between six to uh, 12 months. And as you see by our uh, studies, it's uh, even continue to improve, the one that improves, continue to improve up to uh, five years. So uh, one of the question was, and, and uh, people were right asking this question, is it better than the Brightman alone? Because we saw that the Brightman are quite good. And if it's so good, I don't, I don't understand why people ask for a different solution, but is it better than the Brightman alone? So, Again, Krishman did uh, the study, 12 patients with the balloon, 11 with the Brightman and partial repair already. He also published it in 2017. And look at the result. On the left, these are the, the Brightman only uh, patient. They improved by 15 points or 16 points in constant score. If we look at the balloon at 14 months and 22 months, they improve at nearly 25 or 35 points in the constant score. If we compare it only to the, the Brightman, the uh, balloon group were, was better. The same was goes for the ACS course. The balloon was uh, much better. They were much better than the debridement only. And of course, you should ask, you know, the French guy will say it's a bicep, they're the biceps. So maybe uh, the fact that you kill the biceps, you tenotomize the bicep, that's the, the, uh, the difference. So we published a study on that. In our group, in our uh, multi center study, 23 had the biceps tenotomy. At that time, we didn't tenotomize everybody. Uh, only when the, the, um, the biceps were really, was really torn or, or frayed. So we had 23 patients that uh, we tenotomized the biceps and 23 that we did not. In which there were three that already had the torn biceps. And the results were the same for those both groups. So the biceps in our study did not uh, make the change between success or failure. Uh, what is the becomic, uh, what is the, the, the way the balloon works? That's a very interesting question. We think we know, but uh, we need to prove it in a way. So this study done by Athwell and published in Arthroscopy 2018, he checked uh, five male cad uh, cadavers and he compared the in-space to the supercapsular reconstruction in terms of uh, assessment of humeral head migration and uh, shoulder abduction forces. And he showed that both devices restored the native humeral head uh, position. 
and both groups were effective in restoring the functional abduction forces. So basically, they're working on the same concept of trying to uh, put back the human head in its normal position or near normal position and restore the function of the normal function of the shoulder. Now, this study, unfortunately, I cannot discuss it. Uh, this is the FDA uh, study that uh, is conducting right now in the state for the approval of the balloon in the United States. <coughs> Sorry. And this is a randomized control study to assess the safety and effectiveness of the incest balloon compared to partial repair. So they took groups of uh, massive rotator cuff tear and they compared it to partial repair. Uh, it's an amazing study. It's a multi-center with the best uh, uh, shoulder surgeon in the world. And the result will be very, very interesting, I'm sure, to see the result of the re partial repair because as you see, there's not many... Uh, studies on the partial repair result, as well as the balloon, but uh, we do hope it will uh, be published soon. So how does it work? My thought, and as uh, uh, George Athwell proved, <coughs> sorry, as well as Abud, uh, Professor Abud from uh, the state also uh, had the same result that by lowering the human head back to its place to prove the deltoid function and reposition, and it's, it's easier, it's, it's, it is the pain, so the rehab can be uh, doing better. So basically it's bringing back the shoulder to a non-painful deltoid functioning, but still massive rotator cuff tear. So it doesn't uh, 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 make a solution for the massive tear, but it, make, it makes a solution for the function of the deltoid. So in a way, if we look at this uh, uh, slide, we have the left, the non-surgical, the right, the surgical, and the balloon is something in between. We, we did physiotherapy, we failed, and now we try to ease the pain with the balloon, which is a surgery, of course, but a minor one, and then do the physiotherapy again. And again, to, to maintain a non-painful deltoid function in massive rotator cuff tear shoulder. And the nice about the balloon that it uh, doesn't burn any bridges. You see that we can put the balloon, and if it fails, we still, if it fails, we still have other options. And uh, if I have today to pick up the right patient, so it will not be the same as I did 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we tried it on a very young patient, very old patient, partial tear, complete tear, massive tear, some degree of osteoarthritis. But today I can say, 100% of confidence, but which much, with much more confidence than I had before, that the right patient for me will be with the irreparable rotator of cuff tear, of course, non-osteoarthritic patient, and as well patient preference. There are patients that they, they, they don't want to have a rotator cuff repair rehabilitation, or uh, they cannot go through the surgery or my major surgery because of different uh, problems. I had one patient that had severe... Uh, uh, aortic stenosis, and nobody was uh, willing to uh, put her under general anesthesia. And I did it under local anesthesia, put the balloon in, and uh, it was a miracle for her because we said, okay, we, we have to go to use painkiller for the rest of your life. So today, the ideal patient for me is a full range of motion, painful, non arthritic, irreparable cuff tear. They have to choose the, the best candidate for the balloon, that will be the candidate. And of course, don't use it on osteoarthritis, osteoarthritic patient because they won't get well. Uh, so basically that's the, the, uh, the talk, but now I will be more than happy to go through the discussion and you can see the background, how the balloon works. So this is the device, okay? You create some space, not too much, you put the device under fluoroscopy or uh, under uh, arthroscopy. You inflate it, there are different sizes. So you have different amount of saline that you put inside. It's spread, it's folded, it's transparent and you can see through. And then you just leave it there. I must say, uh, today I use more balloons to put it, it's not our topic, but uh, I use more balloon to put it on top of repair. When I have a very bad uh, uh, tissue, I repair the tendon, I 
not very confident with my repair that it will hold or uh, not as good uh, bonus as I want it to be. And I feel that the anchors may, may be pulled out. So after I doing this repair, I put the balloon on top and you see it pushes gently and nicely the uh, rotator cuff back to its place. And I feel much more confident after this kind of surgery. But of course, we don't have the, uh, we did some studies. The result with or without the balloon were uh, nearly the same. Uh, the pain, pain-wise, the uh, group with the balloon uh, were better, but we don't have a solid uh, um, studies uh, to prove it yet. And this is one of the patient. Sorry, no, it doesn't work. Okay, one video works. That's nice. Thank you. Are we done? Yes. Okay. Uh, you have another video, is it? Yeah, it doesn't work. Uh, I told okay. you, one, one, if one works, that's nice. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dr. Mahman, for that brilliant presentation on uh, cuff tears. I mean, there's a lot of spectrum, a lot of options for tra treatment of a massive cuff tear, and you've gone through each one of those. But what really interests the uh, reader is the balloon, of course. So a few questions uh, with respect to the balloon. Now you, uh, the balloon is made of apriolactone, isn't it? The material is yes, it's some kind vicar. similar to yeah, it's similar to vicar. It's resorbable. It's usually pops out after uh, three to four months, as I mentioned. Yes. And have you? I mean, you have mentioned that the balloon could rarely get displaced if you have done too many releases. But have you encountered a scenario where the balloon could rupture? So first, it's rarely, I don't know if rarely, because uh, in our studies, it showed that uh, it's rarely done. I, but I know, in fact, that I had a few displacement of the balloon, but nothing happens. Uh, the patient says, okay, I, I got a bulge in the front of the shoulder, and you, you press it, and you see that it's probably the balloon. You do a neutral sun, you find it there, but no, no harm done. Uh, I had no case of rupture of the balloon. Uh, you, I had cases of rupture balloon during the surgery. I finished the surgery, I moved the arm, and I saw that it's deflate. And so in this case, you just put a coker in, you roll it over, you take it out, and put another one. Uh, so, but, but I didn't have the case that it ruptured after uh, one month or two months. So what was the reason for that? You could find out. Yeah, probably my mistake. Probably I used a sharp tool or I uh, was too aggressive. Because when you, you when you take the balloon and you inflate it, you throw it on the floor and you can actually put your weight on and it holds. So it's very strong. Okay, thank you for that. Dr. Maman, this is the kind of interim procedure, right? Because in case the balloon doesn't work, we can definitely go ahead and do a another procedure. So how many of them required a secondary procedure in your hands? So uh, we now collected our data of, of up to 10 years follow up uh, from 2009 that we started. Uh, between 11, depends on which uh, um, um, group of patient I choose, but it's around 11 to 15% of our patient were uh, revised to a reverse, okay? It doesn't mean that they were all, that 90% were good. Some of them were not as good and they were reluctant to have another surgery. They say, you know what, I have pain, but I can tolerate this pain. But we did reverse for about uh, between 11 to 15% of our patients. And what was the age group who required a revision? I mean, who required a reverse? Uh, most of our patients with massive rotator cuff tear, you know, they are above the age of 60, 65, and so on, up to 85 years old. Uh, I, we couldn't find no specific age that, uh, since we had only 11% of, of, uh, of revision to reverse, we couldn't find no one uh, um, particular reason for uh, having the, the reverse. So I cannot say for sure whether it was the age issue, maybe our mistakes, maybe it didn't work for them because of their tweet. I don't know. Thank you for that, Dr. Mama. The other concern is, see, the balloon has been in use since 2012, if I'm right, and almost we are down eight years down the line. 
we still do not have a level one data. Of course, there's a level four systematic review that was published last year in the OJSM. Again, that looked at uh, 12 studies and still they did not quote any level one data. So you mentioned about a study that's going to come up. Is it level one? Yes, uh, it's uh, randomized, it's controlled, uh, it's multi-center. Uh, I'm not one of the participants of the study, so I cannot say for sure. That's only what I know from the company. It's uh, done in the United States for the FDA approval, and it's they compare it to a partial repair. Uh, I think that, uh, that the guy that's looking for the results are uh, not aware of which kind of procedure was done. So to the best of my knowledge is a level one, but uh, this is, I think it's the more profound study that, will, that uh, was done about the balloon. And the result of course will be very interesting to see. First of all, the partial repair, how it's, uh, what is the success rate of the partial repair? Because it's also, it's an option. The balloon probably will cost money as well, and it's not available in any country. Uh, so partial repair is still an option. And of course, to see the results of the balloon, to compare both. And even after the completion of that particular study, we would still have just one level one data, isn't it, RCD? Yes, uh, because we are lazy. <laughs> Actually, as the first one to use it, we should have done a good level one study, but it's costly and it's demanding and it's it's very hard to do a good level one study it's very and hard and it's very one of the most difficult studies to do a very good quality randomized control trial the other question uh, prof is you have mentioned a lot of procedures of course you have mentioned the, uh, the muscle transfers and superior capsular reconstruction so if you look at aftas in general without atropathy how would what are the percentage of patients you would choose the balloon and how many of them would undergo superior capsular reconstruction or the muscle transfer in your hands? So uh, I must say I'm biased, okay? I, you must all remember that I'm biased with the balloon. <laughs> but uh, I must say that the concept of, this, of doing the superior capsular reconstruction, it's not very clear to me. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, the reason that they've done it in Japan because they didn't have the reverse and they didn't have the balloon or any other option and tendon transfer, we know that the results are mixed. So uh, what Miata did, he, take, he took the uh, uh, fascia lata of the patient, folded and put a spacer basically, okay? And if it's the patient's own tissue, maybe it will heal better and his results were much better than any other results uh, outside of Japan. Because in the state, nobody will allow, no patient will allow for, to have another skin incision elsewhere and use his own fascia lata. So he used uh, commercial uh, patches and they're not as thick. At the beginning, they used a two or three millimeter patch and now they're using more thicker uh, uh, patch. And it's very demanding surgery and it's very costly. It's in the state, it's cost, just imagine at least five anchors and the patch itself, long uh, or time. And the results, as you see, or as far as I can see, are not better than the other solution. So if you can do the same, the same uh, uh, surgery in 10 to 15 minutes, and probably it will cost less, and the rehab is much faster, and just imagine to do a super capsule reconstruction on an 80 or 85 years old with a very poor uh, uh, quality of bone and the, the tuberosity and the tendon that uh, the anchor that may pull out. So I believe that the, the, if I can compare both, I would go for the balloon. With regard to tendon transfer, I'm not doing a lot. I've did few, but uh, you need, first of all, the, 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 um, the learning curve is, is long to know how, how exactly the tension that you need to put and, and, and how much if you had to need, I, I used did a lower trapezius, um, like uh, Basam Tosas from uh, um, Mayo Clinic. But it was, it is a very demanding surgery and it's the, the rehab for the patient, it's not easy because they have to be in a awkward position after surgery for until the healing. Uh, and I must say that the result that you see, you read in the literature, even with the one that do a lot of this, uh, uh, 
surgery are not superior to the other solutions. So I'm not sure whether it's worth all the effort. So today, if I have an irreparable cafter, depends on the patient, of course, and what exactly is lacking off, whether it's external rotation, that's his main problem. So the balloon won't work for external rotation. And also we, we uh, learned from the balloon that you need to have the, the uh, force, uh, force coupled power to be uh, good. So if I have a subscaptor and a massive irreparable tear, I would repair the subscap and put the balloon afterward. Because if, you, if it doesn't have the subscap, the head will migrate to the front, you're gonna have pain and, and it, it doesn't work. So uh, sometimes I combine partial repair with the balloon. Thank you, Dr. Mama. Of course, you mentioned about the balloon is during the three months of resorption time, you need to get your deltoid strengthened and that's how it's going to work primarily, isn't it? So how is the rehabilitation protocol for these balloon patients? So uh, it's a day it's a day surgery. They get discharged the same day and they start working on the range of motion immediately. At the beginning, we are uh, like the first four to six weeks, we tell them to lift up to around 90 degrees, not too much force, let the balloon settle down, let the, the tissue around it heal, and of course, no weight lifting. And from uh, week five or six, we start full range of motion, uh, again, with no lifting. I had one patient that after two and a half months went to the grocery store and lift a heavy bag, and then she felt the puck. <laughs> so we tell them not to uh, uh, do a, uh, heavy lifting until the balloon resolves. But basically, they start working on the range of motion and strengthening exercise immediately. And what is the cost of the balloon prof with respect to you in uh, US dollars? Depends to which country. I don't know how much it costs in the US because it's not approved uh, yet. I think in Europe, it's around uh, 2,000 euros. Uh, in Israel, it's approximately two thousand okay. dollars. Thank you, Dr. Mamman. I think that's all the questions that we have for today evening. Thank you for joining. It was a wonderful session. A lot of new insight into this unique uh, technique. I'm sure it's going to. I mean, more and more papers are going to come in, and more people are going to do this procedure. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Mamman. It's, it's been a pleasure, an honor. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank Bye -bye. you.